Uh, well, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andreas Hess, um, and we have today as our guest speaker Samantha Ashenham from Birkbeck College. Uh, and just say a few words, uh, I'm not going to use much time here, just a few words about Samantha. Um, she's done, a, she's her first work, she's a, a senior lecturer in uh, sociology, but actually works in the politics department in, uh, in Birkbeck, and also was a one year editor, uh, chief editor of Economy and Society, uh, as such, was one of the last tasks, I think, was to issue a special issue on guilt, which I guess uh, is partly relevant to the topic we're talking about, but I'm just passing this around and uh, to have a quick look. Um, and secondly, uh, she's also an expert in uh, child sexual abuse and has written a book called Governing Child Sexual Abuse a couple of years ago uh, with Bromwich. And uh, more recently, uh, so that Sam and I have embarked on, on two projects. Uh, one is uh, a book on uh, which publishes the unpublished lectures of Judith Sklar on part the, the deal partly with injustice and uh, political obligation, which, which I think is partly relevant here. But then, uh, parallel to that, um, we've embarked on this, what's hopefully going to be a, a a bigger community study um, to which the treatment case is a kind of lens uh, to which we want to look at what's wrong with these modern, this modern community rhetoric that usually perceives community as you know, conflict free, it's all nice, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the question is what happens if you have traumatic events like the one with the treatment case, and that's what someone is going to talk about today. So we're stop and over to you. I mean, usually we have like 45 minutes to talk and then there will be a, a brief segment that we show like four yep. or five minutes from the film later on. Um, <clears throat> over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, and a warning, so this is experimental. Um, and if you've watched the film Capturing the Freedmans, you may still be reeling from that. I'm still reeling from it, having watched it a long time ago. Um, the project, as Andres has just suggested, is to try to look at um, the concept of community as thrown up by this case. I regard this case very much as a kind of lens or window through which we can get at some of the, the um, complex of, of uh, the society, the culture, the politics, the legal structure of America at the time. The original uh, phenomenon started in 1987, but it's still rumbling. Jesse Friedman was in court just last week trying to um, get information out of the state, um, information to, with which to contest his uh, uh, charge of guilt uh, against his name. So this, this kind of carries on in, in the present. What we're trying to do, I think, and I want to make this as clear as I can at the beginning, because um, it's apt to get lost otherwise, is I think Andres and I are both very sceptical about the idea that, that either of us is in a position to work out what really happened. Yeah? So if you like, we're taking a kind of step back um, as a pair of sociologists and saying, let's look at the shape this takes. Let's look at how the institutions, the actors involved, the uh, political and legal infrastructure, if you like, coalesce this as a particular kind of problem and, and keep it on the rails as a particular kind of problem and what the consequences of, of that kind of formation of this, this kind of problem in this way are, or the consequences of for the individuals and so on. So it's not an investigation into, you know, well, who's right and who's wrong, it's more an investigation of the kind of phenomenon and how it appears. So what I'm going to do is to try and talk a little bit about the case in case um, any of you are unfamiliar with it. Um, and then some of the broader kind of contexts in which um, this case initially um, comes to be. And then um, look more closely at the film and then pan out into kind of the lead, some of the legal and, and sociological kind of aspects of it. So the case began in 1987-88 um, as a case of um, alleged mass sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, um, in Great Neck, um, Long Island, New York. Um, Arnold Friedman, who is the um, key character, a retired teacher, 
um, was arrested along with his son Jesse and one of Jesse's friends, Ross Goldstein. At the time, Jesse and I think his friend were about 18 years old. Um, and they're charged with multiple acts of sodomy and other sexual offences that allegedly took place while um, Arnold and his son Jesse ran a computer class in the basement of their house. So you have this event taking place. It, the year, I think, is, is a significant one. 1987 is also the year in which the Gleaton child abuse case happened in, or kicked off in uh, the UK. It comes in the context of a kind of decade of um, fairly large-scale um, examples of uh, people working in childcare institutions being um, accused of um, child sexual abuse in the States. Um, and so there's a whole kind of phenomenon that's, that's going on around the time. Now if we look more closely at what actually precipitates the intervention in the case of the Freedmans, Arnold Friedman, the father of Jesse, the retired teacher, the very well regarded teacher, he is an extraordinarily uh, uh, capable teacher, it would seem to uh, <coughs> um, He comes to the attention of the police when the, when US Customs intercept some child pornography being sent to him from the Netherlands. And so there is child pornography in the post that the police intercept. Um, and the police decide to search Arnold's home and find other um, child pornography. But they also find that um, Arnold is holding this computer class in his basement and make a decision that they will interview um, the children who have attended this so there then is this kind of rolling out of a process of, of um, interviews conducted by police officers. Um, there hadn't been any allegations on the part of any of the children uh, about anything having happened prior to the police um, going out to interview um, these children. There were no complaints until the point when the police start to um, interview. In December 1987, then, Arnold and Jesse are arrested, and, and also Ross Goldstein, are arrested and charged on multiple counts of, of sexual abuse. Now, both Arnold and Jesse enter plea bargains. They, in other words, the case doesn't go to a kind of full trial. It is, uh, there's a kind of a, a plea bargain in which um, both of uh, these um, men uh, agree to a uh, lowered tariff in order that uh, the case doesn't have to go to trial. Um, Arnold then commits suicide. And so Arnold goes to prison before Jesse yeah, um, and spends the rest of his life in prison because he gets 30 years in, in jail is the, the uh, sentence that's handed down, but commits suicide in 1995 whilst in prison. Jesse um, also serves 13 years and is released in 2001. And so uh, both serve uh, prison, extended prison sentences for these crimes. Jesse does a number of different things. Remember, he was 18 when first um, accused. Um, he continues to protest his innocence in, in the present and to appeal. Um, there have been various Deviation. <coughs> so he, the plea bargain is a, you know, he agrees to his guilt um, for a, a, a lower um, sentence initially. He also turns up on a television show some five or six years after um, the events, uh, saying yes, he did do it, but he did it because his father had abused children in Turkey. He learned it from his father. So, so there are various kind of tropes that that can play out around. Um, guilt and innocence that I'll come back to um, in a bit more detail later on. Um, the case goes through then multiple um, attempts at kind of new <coughs> appeal and so on. Jesse has basically been appealing his innocence ever since he came out of prison in 2001, um, right up to the present. Now I think the reason for that, or at least the, the most prosaic reason for that, is that as it stands, Jesse Friedman um, is a convicted sex offender who therefore has various prescriptions on his behaviour, including coming close to any children. So, and he is now married, he and his wife, he apparently have children, etc. Et so this kind of lurches forward with him. The, the criminal justice system says, 
your sentence is spent. But in fact, the kind of designation sex offender runs with him into the present. And that's what he's, he's trying to clear his name about in, in the present. Um, in 2003, then, the case becomes something of a cause celeb when Andrew Jarecki, um, a film director, makes Capturing the Freedom. Um, the film director, Jarecki, um, says of his film, this is the trial that never took place. So he puts his documentary up as the trial. Um, and this is a, a documentary, it's an old documentary, it's a very old documentary. If you're kind of old fashioned like me and you think of documentaries as um, having a certain relation to established and orderly presented facts, because it doesn't do that. It leaves, I mean, it left me feeling nauseous when I first watched it, and then left me feeling like I kind of lost where the floor was, because there are so many different kind of perspectives in it that one finds one quite doesn't know where to stand. Um, but the film was um, shortlisted for an Academy Award for Best Documentary. Um, it is, in large part, constructed through home video footage. One of the odd things about the Friedman family, whatever else we can say about them, we can say they're very hot on home video. Um, so early on in the film, we see David Friedman talking to his video camera as a kind of young man, like 19 or 20. And the first thing he says is, if you're not me and you're watching this, this is kind of video diary kind of, that he's intending to come back to in the future. He says, if you're not me and you're watching this, turn off now. It's kind of this bizarre kind of playing with a kind of narcissistic kind of frame of reference. Um, so there are all sorts of things that, that the film does. <coughs> Essentially, it's central, the, kind of, the central thing we see and what, what, what makes it so difficult to watch, I think, is, is that it, it shows you very intimate scenes of a family falling apart um, under the strain of the kind of period from the charges and the arrest through to <coughs> cases coming to court. Um, but it absolutely isn't, I would want to assert, a trial um, capable of ascertaining the guilt or innocence of, of the accused. Yeah? So Jarecki kind of frames this thing as a trial. It's, it's some sort of staged uh, ritual of its own right, um, but we'll, it's certainly not a disinterested documentary, as you'll see in a minute. Um, Okay, so the, the case and then the film that follows it, I think, throw up a whole host of questions. Um, before we get to the film, just several specific things about the context in which this is pitched, um, which is 1980s America. Um, I've already said there's a, there's a kind of wave of cases of um, sexual abuse. In the 1980s and early 1990s, both in the UK and in the, the US, are a period when um, child sexual abuse comes to be talked about, acted upon, there are endless attempts to work out what kinds of evidence we need to have in order to justify the upholding of intervention into um, private families. There are also endless cases of, of um, sexual abuse reported in institutions. There's a real kind of rooting out of um, what has apparently been hidden trauma up to then. So it's sort of slotted into that kind of uh, topography. Um, but there's also, I think, going on in this period of time, a kind of shifted emphasis. It's something a kind of battle over where sexual abuse is most prevalent. So all of the statistics, or else, tell us that about 80% of child sexual abuse happens within uh, private nuclear families. Yeah, or within slightly extended by you. So it's uncle so and so, or dad or stepdad, mostly men on um, children, not only on children. Okay, so we've got uh, uh, statistical evidence that it's, it's sort of 80% familial, yeah? Um, but the cases that come up, as this one, very often are about the, the idea of a kind of predatory paedophile who's kind of out to get the kids of otherwise nice neighbourhoods. Okay, so that's, that's part of this story. The second aspect of this, of the context for this, is um, the shift towards victims' rights in, and recognition of victims' rights in, in the US. So it was in the 1980s that the Supreme Court in the States decided that video linked evidence could be used in court for um, the prosecution of child sexual abusers. Um, whereas previously, under the Constitution, uh, 
a, a someone accused of such a crime would, would have the right to confront their witness. Yeah, there's a similar kind of argument that goes on in the UK around the use of, of various um, means <coughs> to enable the production of evidence for courts in a way that isn't quite so kind of uh, another layer of trauma for a child who may have been abused. So there's there's the shift towards victims' rights. There's also the Mies Commission in 1986, which I think is also significant to what then happens in 1987 with the move from um, Arnold receiving pornography in the post to the idea that, well, let's look at the children he's been um, teaching in computer classes. The Mies Commission makes a link between pornography and um, sexual violence yeah, that is otherwise contested in the kind of American kind of context. There are endless debates around whether there is actually a kind of uh, an effect produced by pornography that, that produces a greater propensity towards sexual violence. And Mies came up with the idea that yes, you can link these two. So that's that's also on the agenda. And then more broadly there is a shift towards um, policing through the criminal law. Mayor Giuliani in New York kind of clearing up the city by um, taking hold of the kind of criminal law, law and using it in a much more kind of practical way. So there are a whole series of, of, of phenomena that kind of cluster around this that are, that are part of the zeitgeist, if you like. And then we have Great Neck, which is a really interesting um, suburb of New York, I suppose I would call it. It's on a peninsula. Um, it's on Long Island. Um, it's about 35 minutes from Manhattan by train. It's um, affluent, it's fairly liberal, it is fairly Jewish, it has about 10,000, or had, the 2010 census had just under 10,000 inhabitants. <coughs> it, um, the, the Jewish community and the freedoms are of that community, I think, range from liberals through to fairly orthodox um, groups. There's sort of a melange of people from Brooklyn, the Bronx, as well as from Iran. So you've got a kind of mixture of, of different kind of Jewish groups in there. But a fairly kind of liberal place that you might um, look to as a kind of middle class affluent um, city worker, as a place to kind of bring up your children. It's got nice lawns, it's, you know, it's orderly. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of place in which this happens. Okay, and then the film. Okay, the film. Um, Andrew Jarecki uh, recounts in uh, one of the uh, extra pieces to this uh, film. He says, "Well, I started making a film about children's entertainers. I was looking at you know clowns in New York City and you know people who um, employ clowns to entertain their kids because they're not funny enough themselves." Um, and then he finds David Friedman who is the, brother, uh, the other brother of Jesse. Jesse has two brothers. He has David Friedman, who is a central protagonist in this film, and um, Seth, who refuses to participate in the film. It's very interesting how the family position themselves differently in relation to this. David Friedman is one of New York's best loved clowns. Children's entertainer. There's a lot at stake here. Okay. Um, and David, um, whilst being interviewed by Andrew Jarecki, tells Jarecki about this kind of trauma that has happened in his family just uh, five, six years before, um, in which his father and younger brother have been um, found guilty of these multiple accounts of uh, multiple, multiple counts of sexual abuse. And David is very clearly kind of uh, traumatized by this himself. What the film then does, so Jarecki changes track. He starts with this idea of making a film about children's entertainers and ends up with a film about family breakdown. Okay. The film, as I said, uses extensively um, the home video footage of, taken primarily by David, who seems to be kind of hell-bent on filming everything in his life, much to his mother's uh, uh, consternation. Um, and what we see then is, is not only the kind of family breakdown, but the way in which kind of guilt slops about, the charges slop about, people behave in all sorts of bizarre ways. So the film is, I think, a, a kind of odd uh, combination of drama, advocacy, um, voyeurism, um, and kind of it has a huge 
tendency to kind of destabilize the viewer. I think I'm just going to show you a couple of short um, clips from it and then come back to you. You could see that this wasn't exactly Fred McMurray and my three sons, right? It's a, I was struck us as being a very dysfunctional family, obviously. And we'd have to, you would have to wonder, wouldn't you, what kind of a family situation you would have that could produce this kind of crime? And what might it be like to grow up in a household like this? I don't know, I can't even imagine. Today is September 14th, 1975. We just concluded a tour of Jungle Safari. Jungle in Habitat. Jungle Habitat in West Milford, New Jersey. Here are my three brothers. Two brothers, Two brothers. Not me. I, There are three <laughs> children. What happened was the three sons were like a gang, like a, this is our gang. And mom, mom, She's not, she's not part of our gang. And we have, of course, <laughs> a pterodactyl. A pterodactyl? Well, and a Jewish pterodactyl. Ah, smart, smart, The four of us got along so well. We had a very similar kind of sense of humor. You know, one guy would say something and then it would, then the next person would add to the joke. And my mother, who has no sense of humor, and she just didn't get that part of us, and she resented that. When this whole thing blew apart, the men got together, and Arnold confided in them, and me. And I was a loyal wife. People told me, oh, why don't you leave him? He's a horrible person. Just walk out and leave him. And I didn't. I went all over town. I raised money for bail. I, I called every relative I knew. I begged. And I did all this for him, right? He was my husband. I loved him. And no one said, what do you want to me? Toast today being here next year. Ma, your toast? Or even next month. OK. OK. I think we can eat now. So you're saying, so what we, what we have is the people who we thought would testify and say that nothing happened the are telling the comments that something happened. happened. And we are afraid to put them on the witness stand, even though we know that nothing happened, we think they will say something happened. The Freedman suggested that we speak to various people who may have been present at the time, and some of those people weren't alleged victims at all, and that the hope was that, that one or more of these people would say, this is just not true, uh, but that, that just didn't happen. He's not getting favorable, and he's getting negative. The kids who they were said, this one kid who, who, wasn't, who wasn't pressing charges, he wasn't approached by the police, or maybe he was, but he didn't join up with the police, and he's claiming that something happened. As far as I'm concerned, he's being, he's, clearly he's lying. I mean, nothing happened. Well, if something happened then, so then nothing happened. We begged him to tell us that something happened, to explain how this whole mess could have happened. That's the only way to explain how it could have happened, other than the fact that the police are out of their minds. He, we begged him. He told us nothing happened. That's good enough for me. Nothing happened. If my father had the ability to confess to me, yeah, he had done something one time, and that's how this whole crazy mess got started, it would make a lot more sense. Not that I wanted that to be the case, but you, you have to find a way to explain the unexplainable. Oh my god. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Is that a real ice cream? What's so odd about it? They had this idealized image of this father as being this saint-like person, this Santa Claus messiah, you know. And professionals in the field say that 
oh, they have this idea that uh, children identify with the abusive parent. When I was about a year or two, my parents separated. And what did I do? My father is wonderful. My mother is terrible. The truth is, my father was a rat, just like David's father. My father walked out. This is not wonderful. This is being a rat. My mother was, my mother was an egg. Well, I mean, this is true, but look, she stayed with me. She took care of me. So people, uh, visions are distorted. I never felt angry at my dad. My dad had nothing to do with this. Someone knocks on the door and accuses you of a crime you didn't commit. You gotta, you gotta attack, attack your attackers and do what you can. And um, that's all it was. It had nothing to do with. There was nothing else that was involved at all. Why are we talking about honoring? Yeah, but yeah, talk about honoring. Do you honor and respect your husband? That's why I don't talk to you. I said I did honor and respect oh, okay. my husband, but you don't like that answer. No, I don't. I don't believe it. No. To ask your father, do I honor and respect yes, you? Do, again, do you object right to here. my object handling? To, to David, do you I have any objection in my relationship with you? No. Do you like it when she calls you slime? She doesn't call me slime. She did. Did you, you like it when she no, did? not that one time. Okay. That was the only time. Did you like, do you like it when the she did? The other cases that I've written about, those families have been much stronger. They First of all, they've started from an, a monolithic feeling of innocence, which didn't exist in this family because of Arnold's pedophilia. And they just buckle down and everybody gets behind the defendant, the accused family member. People quit their jobs and, you know, people are all sitting around the kitchen table for the next three years with staplers and Xerox machines and they're working on um, the defense, and then when the um, defendant is convicted, they're working on the appeal, and all family conflict is submerged. Why don't you try once to be supportive of me? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we all started at the beginning of this thing, and, it, and, and, and I... Well, let's start from right now. Start? Okay, let's right start from now. right now. All right, let's start from right now. We're all start brand new. We're all starting brand new. We have a decision-making process on the table. It's Great. clear. Great. All the past mistakes, they were mistakes. We're not going to hold Great. them against anyone. Great. Now we're starting afresh. Okay. Gorgeous. My opinion is, is that did. I Stop. Lower your wanted voice and talk nicely okay, to your son. On. You guys to cool me. All right, now we're going to do it. Starting now. Seth, why don't you call me? Do Seth, I call you? Elaine. Yeah. Hi. Teddy. Okay, interview. Arnie. Number four seven five three two oh sir. Don't please don't film me. I mailed or received. David, I told you I don't <laughs> want to be on tape. Why are you so She wants no his she want when we stop talking to her. She doesn't want any even record, any, any oh, record at all. Wonderful. As if they were. Jesse, yeah. they they, they, David, if your mother doesn't want to be filmed, don't film her. Okay. Come on. When it was all over, they said it was all my fault because I wanted them to do, take a plea. And, and it had been arranged before. Arnold wanted, agreed to take a plea. Mm -hmm. But they were very hurt. Yeah. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. May not be here very much longer, but I'm still here. <laughs> That's the spirit. The sentence, 10 to 30 years. The crime, sodomizing young boys. Defendant Arnold Friedman had pleaded guilty to sexually abusing more than a dozen youngsters. But this does not end the Friedman case. There are still numerous sodomy and sex abuse charges pending against Arnold's son, Jesse Friedman. You know, without Daddy in this case, mm -hmm. I can't see any reason why we shouldn't go to the media with this. I mean, we could try this case in the media. <clears throat> who's gonna Who's gonna buy that I sodomized boys? Who's yeah, I agree it? with you. I agree with you. No, I really. Well, I don't think we have to try. Well, all I want to do 
I think we can certainly we can go to trial and prove it in the trial. We didn't make a deal with Arnold Friedman to spare his son. So his son is facing a multiple count indictment. He's facing a considerable amount of jail time. And now he's confronted with a situation where Long Island knows that his father admitted his guilt. And there's a reasonable human expectation of some people that, uh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And if he did it, maybe his son did it. He was, we know he was in the same class and he was helping his father. So I think that was a, a difficult thing for Jesse to have to overcome. So a clip then showing you some of your family dynamics and then a clip that's specifically about the plea bargain and the kind of predicament it leaves, Jesse in, in particular. Um, but first, before we come to those things, the, the idea that the film is the trial, I think this is a really interesting assertion on the part of the director. Um, if we look at other, if we think about the role of, of media in relation to this case, it becomes quite multi-layered. So you have, um, around the time of the initial trial and then uh, the, public, the, the production of the, the film, you have rival voices within the print media. So you have, for example, the New York Times um, trying to investigate, a, sort of work out what what's what here. You have the Village Voice, um, a much... Um, different kind of voice saying, you know, the, the, uh, the family is innocent, this is a heavy-handed state. So, so there's a kind of battle that goes on in, in the print media. But you also have then, you have home video footage, you have the accession of a kind of documentary on the part of Jarecki, and then you have the images that Arnold receives through the post that kick the whole thing off. So I think the, the, the question of images in, in this um, context and, and their relation to what we might call kind of real events, is an interesting one that I just want to kind of leave hanging in the air. What the film does, though, is um, dramatise, but in a wholly different way from the way in which a criminal trial would, um, the event. Yeah? It engages in um, a kind of voyeuristic um, non-checking of, of evidence that, that um, is the mirror of, I think, of the kind of problems of, of the, the film are kind of mirrored in the problems of the, the plea bargain. Um, the film, if you like, plays to the court of public opinion. I like to think of courts as, as kind of dramatizing places, but they're dramatizing places with rules of evidence. Um, the documentary, in the hands of Jarecki, is a kind of dramatization to the court of public opinion in which there is no cross-checking of evidence. There are not specific evidentiary requirements. And so you get this kind of layering of different points of view that is, is quite destabilizing. So what I want to try and do in the kind of, uh, the last sort of part of what I want to say is to sort of dig through this question of, of the, both the, the um, legal process that rolls on into the present and the idea of the, the film itself as a kind of trial, the trial that didn't take place. It's interesting the dominance of, the, of, of law and legalistic kind of thinking in this context. The, the law functions here both as a kind of metaphor, the film is the trial, yeah, so, um, and is a kind of structuring condition for the possibility of the way the whole thing kind of pans out. Okay, so there's an assumption in, written in, into the logic of this, that the kind of legal process in some way, or some kind of quasi-judicial process, is a solution to the problem of a kind of trauma um, in a community. Um, it, I think, functions in the opposite direction. It functions to exacerbate um, a lot of these uh, problems. And, and as things get over, overlaid and overlaid, then it becomes more and more difficult to work out what may actually have happened. I want to focus in a bit on the um, plea bargain. Um, one of the interesting things, I think, that, that goes on in child abuse cases, or possibly in all cases involving sexual crime, is that um, on the one hand the criminal law is you know looks at acts has x committed or has he or she not committed this illegal act yeah mm -hmm. and the judgment is is of whether acts have been committed on the other hand if we think about the way in which we construe sexual offenses 
we attach them immediately to the idea of personality, the idea of the dangerous individual, the idea of the kind of the sex offender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we get the the transition from Arnold receiving pornography in the post to his um, confessed uh, love of boys to the idea of um, the sexual offences that are alleged to have gone on in his um, house. Yeah. So you get a shift from from acts to to personalities, which I think is is quite an interesting sort of subtext to, to how this this case kind of gains its velocity. Then, the plea bargain in this context um, is, I think, one of the mechanisms by which Arnold becomes, whether or not he's guilty, he certainly becomes a scapegoat for all sorts of things that are happening in this little kind of nexus of relationships. So, the plea bargain, um, I think, makes, um, makes of the sexual abuse case in 20th and 21st century America, something like the exceptional crime of the 17th century in um, Britain and elsewhere. The, and if you look back at um, the kind of jurisprudence of witch trials in the 17th century, um, there is um, a special set of procedures that uh, apply to um, those alleged uh, to have committed crimes of witchcraft. In other words, hearsay evidence is allowed in relation to their trial. And I think in some ways, the, the plea bargain, why it doesn't allow you know, hearsay evidence and so on, is something you know, not entirely dissimilar happens. The sex abuser is a kind of monstrous character. The sex abuser doesn't really have anywhere to stand. If we then allow plea bargain in this circumstance, yeah, we, we give someone a route that looks like an escape route from a criminal justice procedure that may well end up with their with the death penalty. Yeah? We give them a, a kind of lesser penalty for a confessing their guilt. So we already kind of muddy the water. So the idea of the kind of the pollution of the sex offender, um, the, the, the polluted kind of person, then kind of gets acted upon by a kind of legal process in I think quite a coercive well, as I say, whether or not these particular individuals are guilty of, of the crimes that they've gone down for, um, I think this is a kind of inherently kind of difficult uh, area of law because what goes on in a plea bargain, in, in any circumstance, I think plea bargains are coercive, but in relation to sex offenders, the sex offender is this sort of monstrous figure, um, the, the figure that, that the community has to exclude, has to expel, has to kind of get rid of in order to be um, whole again, to be, to, to, to heal itself. Um, so you get, and, and you get a collapsing of various moments that if, you, if the thing had gone through a full trial process, there's accusation, there's determination, there's sanction, these things are parceled out in a kind of standard criminal process that get collapsed into um, one uh, person's decision in, in the case of the, the kind of plea bargain. So it's, it's a bit like a kind of forced confession, I think, for, for Arnold Friedman. He doesn't feel as though he's got anywhere else to stand. When he enters into the plea bargain, then he jeopardizes the possibility of his son um, protesting his innocence, because how can Jesse be innocent if Arnold was already pleaded guilty? So you get a kind of chain that, that kind of follows them through. And it goes very much against the grain of the um, American constitution, the idea of a kind of right to trial and to um, trial in front, front of a, a, a jury, um, rights against self-incrimination and a right to, to confront um, hostile witnesses. So there are all sorts of reasons to be suspicious of, of plea bargaining in general, but I think particularly in relation to things like sexual offences, where um, there is a notion that, that only someone who is kind of um, a moral monster um, can do <coughs> this kind of act. So I think that's, that's part of, of um, the kind of problem of the case. Um, it, I'm not saying that there is no, uh, there is no crime here, um, but what I'm trying to open up to you is the way in which the layering of this, both in terms of the, the kind of plea bargaining, the sentencing and so on, and then the film, actually make the case worse. So let's look a little bit in kind of rounding this up 
at the issues of kind of pain and trauma, guilt and complicity, and, and so on as these run through. Um, there's pain and trauma everywhere. I think even if you've just seen the, the little bit of the film that, that I've shown you, it's um, we're invited to view a family in pain. The family going through this extraordinarily difficult kind of Passover meal, yeah, in which um, there's a kind of breaking down and a rounding on the mother. And one of the other things that's interesting in here is the, the kind of boy is rounding on the, the kind of uh, the mother for not for breaking rank, but for saying, well, you know, I don't know whether he's guilty or innocent of this. You no, know, she she's got a certain amount of objectivity about her, has it been? She. She's, you know, and she's saying this in private, she's not saying it elsewhere, she's saying it in private, but they round on her as, um, you know, not part of, not properly part of the gang. So there's pain and trauma in that. There is the pain and trauma of the alleged victims. I haven't shown you scenes in which people are kind of recounting um, things that um, apparently happen to them at the hands of, of Arnold um, Friedman. Then we have guilt and complicity. Everywhere. We have Arnold and Jesse um, accepting the plea bargain. We have the guilt and complicity of the family members as they try to kind of stoke up the idea that well, we, have, we have to band together, we have to be together in this, we are a kind of unit. Yeah. Um, we have us watching as, as, as kind of almost made complicit by, by watching and the community itself and its, its kind of reaction. And then we have multiple confessions to go along with that. Um, complicity. We have the confessions of, of Jesse and Arnold um, in the plea bargaining situation. We have Elaine confessing essentially to the kind of documentary. We have um, Arnold's brother also coming up with the material. So it's a big kind of confessional. Um, but the, all of that, that guilt, I think, functions as a kind of pollution. I think the clearest way of, kind of demonstrating this is, is that section I showed you, a very short section in which Jesse's predicament is made very clear. Yeah, Arnold pleaded guilty. It becomes almost impossible for Jesse to simply to assert his guilt. It won't work because how could he be? And so the attorney, the the local um, solicitor, who is part of the community, probably doesn't want to defend a, an alleged sex abuser, and um, says, you know, go for the plea bargain. If you're an 18 year old in that situation, what do you do? So this whole thing kind of folds in on <coughs> making Arnold and to some extent Jesse a kind of cipher for all of the sins that are supposed to have gone on in this place. In the meantime then, the rest of the community looks like it can remain this um, middle kind of 35 minutes from Manhattan Island. Um, last week, uh, Andreas said to me, there's a brilliant line at the end of Hilary Putnam's, uh, Robert Putnam, wrong Putnam, um, <laughs> Robert Putnam's um, social capital. Um, he says, you know, well, the thing we want in community is Salem without the witches. And I suppose that one of the things that I'm thinking about in relation to this is that you can't have Salem without the witch, because the witch is the boundary figure or the child abuser is the boundary figure who enables the kind of coherence of community to function. And you don't need, you don't need uh, Robert Putnam for that. You could go to René Girard or Mary Douglas or Christina Lana. So um, the idea that community is constituted in part through its, its the figures who are liminal, the figures who don't fit, the figures who can be scapegoated or um, excluded in order to kind of make um, the inside look um, like it's a kind of rosy place to bring up your kids. I'm going to stop there. Thanks very much. <laughs>
how abuse could be organized, mm -hmm. network, etc. Yeah. Something we now believe actually has happened. So in other words, basically, we lose metaphor as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. So the metaphor, basically, of the satanic abuse explicitly occurs in Cleveland. Well, no, it doesn't occur. It's not satanic abuse in Cleveland. That's Rochdale and Rochdale. Rochdale. Pardon me, I'm mixing it up. Oh, you, the wrong thing. But you get, you get what I'm trying to yeah. say, basically. Because my sense yeah. of this is the language for talking about, for formula, for theorizing mm. the actual abuse that takes place. Mm. My mm. question to you is that yeah. here you have a situation in the United States at the same time period where I imagine that child sexual abuse is just coming into the, the foreground, where yeah. although there are some pioneering court decisions and processes around it, mm. there isn't really a language for talking about it, managing it, policing it, and so on, and there's a certain mm. amount of moral panic around it. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it's a very obvious first stage, a kind of a moral panic. <coughs> And yes. the Freedmans, for better or worse, are caught up in that. Yes. Uh, and their case is a particularly striking one because of the video evidence that they left. And we can look into their, voyeuristically, into their lives, their experiences. Yeah. While then basically also getting some sort of denial of any sort of guilt. And this incredible dynamic within which guilt is denied and obfuscated, where it's almost like a, a Gita Serene is talking to a, you know, the, What's his name? Um, Albert Speer. Speer, that's the one, yes. And that famous one that also played out in the So, in other words, basically, the book guilt has been absolutely obfuscated. Mm -hmm. And the same way you're kind of positing that outside is this, you know, this, 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 this is, this is the, the idol of the community. And that's simply put, they're the witches. But there are so many other things going on. Oh, sense. yeah. No, um, which is why, I mean, at the outset, I tried to say, well, look, there, there is this broader context in yeah. which, which feeds this and gives it some of its velocity. Yeah. I think it's a case. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't, you have the time to deal with that, I suppose. Yeah. No, no, I think that's, well, this is the first stab at trying to kind of think about, okay, how do we, how do we structure this? And it seems, I mean, I think it seems to both of us that one of the, one of the things that is most intractable about this is that everybody resorts to a kind of legal, legal or quasi-legal kind of way of thinking about this, as though that could put this thing back on the rails, when I mean, it's not at all clear that that can put this thing back on that. So one of the things that's interesting is that even whichever side the protagonist is on, um, there is this idea of, of the trial. It's a kind of punitive, it's partly a kind of punitive approach. But okay, partly but you're, again, again, what you're doing is you're doing several layers of distancing from the event. Yeah. We're not talking about the abuse of the children, we're not yeah. even talking about no, the sociology no. of the community. We're talking about a sociological interpretation of an interpretation of what might or might not have happened in the community. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a distance off, frankly. Right? So what else can you do? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying, yeah, these are the caveats. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we don't want to. Yeah, but one of the interesting things, I'm sorry if I just come in for a second. I mean, one of the interesting things is now you, the latest rulings and latest interventions, so, you know, in the New York Times and in the the New York Law, uh, so law Journal. Law Journal. Yeah. I mean, you find out what, what's happening now is legalism. Right? Uh, I mean, the lawyers will go on and on and on, and it gives them work for another 10 years. Sure. Uh, and, 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 you know, the old saying where you once want to have justice, you have no other law, that's exactly what happened there. And then to equate legalism with a form of justice or justice seeking is problematic. Uh, it does only partly. It, it only does uh, partly do a job. Do it, it does only do partly do a job, um, but it doesn't give you the full picture. So one of the things that you can do with a more comprehensive analysis: look at the community, the demographics of it. I mean, it's, this is not happening in Alabama or in, yes. in Mississippi. Yeah. The people would have been lynched by now, right? This is not happening. Then. You know, quite frankly, when I looked at the evidence, I mean, we have this argument about it. I think well, there's no more organic here. It's a liberal Jewish community of Manhattan, uh, in, in many other ways, sexually quite, you know, not really conservative. Um, and then you have this ring of wrangle going on between, if you want, uh, the nephews, which work for the village boys, I mean, the kind of lefty uh, spectrum in New York, and then you have the New York Times, which are kind of, they all come from the same place, <coughs> in, from, from Long Island. Okay. Uh, so you've got interesting scenarios that you can look at kind of secondary debates and they give you a deeper insight on in how the community works or doesn't work. What you're doing is something very interesting in one respect. I mean, in Ireland we're used to hearing about institutionalized abuse and the large percentage is the victims for recognition. 
that the system <coughs> let down the victims in their efforts mm -hmm. to tell the story. The legality of it is let down the victims in terms of getting due process. Yeah. And now it's about basically putting those narratives on the record and basically, if you will, being restorative in that sense. Whereas here it's almost coming at it from the other side. It's coming at those processes from the other side. But at the same time, these are processes that are at once liberal because the community doesn't engage in moral panic. At the same time, decisive insofar as basically you have somebody who's abusing children and the system works and sends against this person behind bars. That's the viewpoint. By not necessarily traumatizing all the victims or denying it for several years in order to make that happen. So there's all manner of things going on that are really fascinating. Though. Yeah, well, I mean, just having been brought up in that period, there was a famous case in Cat, Cat California, I believe, of the mother and the son who were, uh, had run a daycare Mid -Mosin. center. Midmosin? Yes, yeah. Mid -Mosin. Yeah. And, and the kids, of course, apparently uh, were subject to basically this trial procedure yeah. where, where they all said that they had been abused. And then it was found out that they lied mm -hmm. yeah. and that they basically had been told but that they had suffered abuse. And it caused a trauma across the country because who could you trust? Mm -hmm. And then the whole repressed memory thing came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where in the U.S. it wasn't about actual victims of abuse who were afraid to come for forward. It was about people who had troubles who basically claimed repressed memories that were untrue. And so, so that's the actual context of this in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. So that's why, why I was wondering about the actual facts, because what you have is one fact, that, that uh, Arnold got child porn through the mail. That's the only fact that we have. Okay? What I haven't heard is that was there any actual evidence of the children on record to the police right, actually saying that anything had happened. Because this is the same type of, of, of scenario as the Martin case, except it's a father and a son. Yeah. And, and it's a different type of a, a, an institution. Well, it's within the household. But it's the same idea of mass sexual abuse yep. that no one knows, knows about. So immediately from my perspective, I wonder whether this occurred at all. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Arnold basically felt extremely guilt, guilty because he was caught doing something that a, a, a liberal Jewish man family man shouldn't do, yeah. and what he confessed to was basically the fact that he had these uh, you know, desire, sexual desires for yeah. children, mm -hmm. and that's why he pleaded guilty. That to me would seem to be the, the Yakum's razor view of things. Yes. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, and so, that, you know, so that, that's why I thought geez, that would be another way to approach you know, from an American context of someone who's actually lived through the 80s. And mm. things, so. But it's very similar debate went on through the 80s and into the early 90s in the UK around um, the way in which children were interviewed. Mm. So that it is possible, I mean, not only with children, but also with adults, if you repeatedly interview person and put to them that, you know, this is something that they should feel, in the end a person might end up feeling like, well, I have to kind of concur with that in order that this interview really stop. I mean, there is that. And uh, so, now, then I think that, that makes me think, and maybe this is, maybe um, Brian would say well, this is letting yourself off the hook too easily, um, but that leaves me then in a position of... Uh, I, I kind of like the position that Ian Hacking takes when he looks at this, which is to say, look, there are these processes that go on that we can track sociologically, where certain sorts of lived reality come into being. So, as a sociologist, you know, as a, as a citizen and as a mother and all sorts of other things, I can't be nominalist about whether someone's been sexually abused. But if I think sociologically about it, I can say, in a sense, at this, in this particular, kind of through, looking through this particular lens, that's not the question to ask. The question to ask is, well, what happens when, when this gets off the ground as an idea and becomes the lived reality of a group of people? So multiple personalities are Hacking's kind of uh, example. Yeah, he says, well, how is it that we get this? Um, exponential rise in the number of people diagnosing multiple personality disorder. People start to live multiple personality lives. It's a script that makes sense of a certain kind of dissociated state of being. Um, and he gives an account of this that is very much to do with the ways in which whether or not something has, has actually happened, if you like, in the real, it becomes a lived real experience. And I think that that's perfectly possible. 
which doesn't answer any of those jurisprudential questions, but it's certainly important for me. Can, can I just throw in? I mean, there, yeah. there are. I mean, there's 700 pages of evidence yeah. uh, that have been. Uh, they are publicly available, and you can get that from the state economic office and from from the same community. So that is available. All the records, the interviews, the evidence that was produced at didn't go to full trial because, but it went to a jury. It went to uh, the jury didn't then didn't have to do anything because the the, the plea bargaining kicked in. The, the other problem is how sodomy and sexual abuse are being defined in the United States. Uh, so one of the peculiarities in the United States is that no penetration does have to take place, but which makes it very hard to, to come up with you know, medical evidence. But you have, I mean, it's not like there's no evidence at all. There's more than what was said there. So what we know from, it was released just last December, sorry, the December before uh, 2013, is, and you can download it, I mean, 780 pages of the transcripts of interviews with the children. What's blacked out is the, uh, the names and, and concrete hints and so on and so forth. And uh, it also went through a process in which the state attorney, because he, he was ordered, or she was ordered, uh, to do this again by a state judge in neighboring, uh, wasn't in New York, I can't remember now. But uh, he, he ordered basically the, the uh, attorney to revisit the case, to collect, to go through all the evidence again, see whether any procedural mistakes have been made. And I, mean, I must say, if you read the report, I must say, I mean, as a consumer of that, you know, interested in the case, I think, well, you know, this is heavy, pretty heavy stuff, and it, it's not to be neglected. You know, or to be pushed Can I just on the side. ask what age they were? The children were between, most of them were between 8 and 12. Yeah. Old enough to be kind of on their own at a computer class, mm -hmm. not old enough to... I mean, additionally, the state attorney said that by today's standards, things would have been investigated differently. Mm -hmm. So what they did at the time, they were clever enough and followed mm -hmm. procedures. One of the problems was that it was handed down from the FBI to the local police, mm -hmm. which meant less super qualified people who would deal normally with other things did the investigation. But that's part of the normal procedure. There's not much you can do about it. You go for the stronger case that you have. In this case, it wasn't the FBI case or child pornography, but serious sexual abuse. So they went for that. They went down that route. But that left. Uh, the, the investigating authorities with the police that you know, have in that community who are not specifically trained to, to do that, but by the standards of the day follow pretty much procedures. For example, they split up in different teams, separated them by gender. They did all the things that, you know, the, the first important steps they did. Did they bring a child psychologist as it is now practice or has become practice in recent years? No, they didn't. So, yes, there are, there's a little, there's a shadow hanging over over some of the evidence. And did, did the children, since they were age 12, when they were like 20 or 25, did they, have they come forward and said, yes, it actually happened? Some have come forward and said, yes, it actually happened, and some have said, no, it didn't happen. And I was repeatedly questioned. Hmm. Are there any that came back and said, and like that, or any when they were age 8 or 12 said it did, and they came back when they were 20 and said, no, it yeah. didn't? Hmm. Yeah. There are, because there was repeated kind of questioning, which is really problematic. And you have to remember that then the, the police have got the, the power and resources of the state at their command. So it's, it's uh, not <coughs> even... I think one of the parents is quoted as saying they came under pressure from the other families in the perception that they were denying the abuse that the yes. other parents were being abused. Yeah. There was a certain community yeah. pressure yes. on the families to go along with the narrative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. see the interesting thing. I mean, we're still having the debates, you know, what, what do you think, you know, how, what really happened? I mean, you inevitably have, you have that. At the same time, it would be fatal to go down that route. Because, I mean, it's impossible, to, we can't do the police's job, nor the judge's job. Uh, and then there are sometimes surprising comments which make you wonder, this which one, directly to the point of, you know, guilty or not, is his brother later on says, on camera, uh, look, I mean, he confessed, my brother confessed to me that everything that happened did happen before he died and committed suicide. Now that's a pretty strong statement. Right? Mm -hmm. Now this is the same brother who had been abused by his brother before that, which is also unlikely. So, you know, you can you can forever debate this, but I don't think this is the most interesting mm -hmm. thing, right? The interesting thing is more how this plays out, the trauma in the community, uh, 
and you know the kind of knock-on effects it has. Nobody wins in this here, uh, and the, there would be further legal procedures pending. But now you take a closer look at the small prints all about should the, you know, what kind of information should be published, should the names come out of those individuals, and so on. So forth. But, you know, I mean, legally very interesting, but sociologically speaking, there's much in it. Just a quick observation. One of the <coughs> sort of defining features of the, the moral panic is that the, the folk table protagonist typically is the sort of scene but not heard. You know, they're, they kind of inhabit the imagination rather than mm -hmm. actually getting their voice heard. And, and so it seems one of the striking features is actually I mean, simply the, the point of perspective, I mean, if anything. Um, perhaps folk devils can, in years to come, hope to uh, you know, shape the, perhaps what they feel to be the distortions that, that affected their, their presentation, but typically you know, yeah. your reality has been set and then your, your discredited person perhaps tried to have a voice, but what else would you expect them to say? Well, yeah. So we so yeah. actually see the, the, yeah. the kind of routine that makes the, all the, the kind of, my God, painful uh, family dinners is, um, itself is quite interesting, you know, just to mm. have a kind of from a normal point of view, mm. as opposed to literally somebody in the, in the dock and speaking to, a, to a, an interrogator, you know, speaking to family members as opposed to an interrogator. Yeah. No, I mean, I think Arnold's shame at the, you know, the, he is quite um, sort of resigned to his fate. I think maybe you saw that um, in the clip here. And, and I think he, if you think about his subject position structurally, he doesn't really have anywhere to go because this is a man who has received child pornography who has had a couple of um, relationships with boys that would have been frowned upon. Um, he is clearly a kind of paedophile, but that doesn't, and, and you know, states as much, but that doesn't necessarily mean he did what is then alleged to have happened. But in the circumstances, if you're in that position anyway, and then you're faced with a trial, um, which then might make a worse outcome for yourself and for your son. There's this whole kind of wrangle about how do I lessen the, lessen the shame, lessen the, the kind of uh, the guilt that spreads through this family. And I think and so. He was suicidal and he was suicidal. Yes, the insurance money. Yes, yes. Well, was exactly. Million, yeah. It was two years. It was beyond the two-year exclusion period. Yeah. So. That's right. This is my only way of helping my son now. Is, mm -hmm. is doing this. Yeah. yeah. So just a last. Uh, I mean, it is striking to the, the you know, the folk devil, it, it's, it helps if they're, you know, a different colour, speak with a different accent, you know, they come from the other side of the tracks, and, mm -hmm. and just to consider the, the generic difficulties that arise when, lo and behold, you're a member of the establishment, and suddenly you have a, you know, because in a sense it's not simply the, the, the dynamics of the family, it's also, oh, my goodness, all the other people who, happily, trustingly, gave their children to the care of, of, of this particular family, of this particular computer class, of this particular teacher, and mm. all the other teachers then in turn, you know, do they not, do they not know? Mm. So, um, you know, the knock-on effect for them to them. So, so are you, is your argument then that this becomes more problematic for the community? Because he is an, he's an established and well-regarded school teacher, he's just retired, he's not, you know... Yes, and even, and even, I mean, the affability comes across, yeah. into, you know, pleasant, charismatic, mm. jolly, you know, yeah. and make a fool of himself with balloons, yes. great, yeah. you know. Um, and our new toll is, you know, yeah. chess fields. Yes. Oh, and, and I remember the, you mentioned the, the, the sale of witch trials, I mean, casualties there was the woman from the Caribbean and uh, the Quakers mm. because they take their hats off and yep. there was a, a woman who lived alone and was a bit you know belligerent or had opinions and, mm -hmm. and you know just the, the sense of the, the outsider they, they didn't have the social capital that the, mm. that they respected and it's interesting that, that that case fell apart because suddenly then the girls started identifying people who were kind of unimpeachable 
Yes. You know, like something we don't trust them anymore. We believe them when they're identifying the, the outcasts. So maybe then that, that account of the, the sort of moral panic, the folk devil, we have to rethink that a bit in the context of Arnold being such a kind of pillar of the community, actually. And maybe it doesn't quite work in that way. Perhaps it then gives rise to a, a subsequent moral panic, I wonder. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But I, I, I saw it twenty years ago. I can't quite remember all the dynamics, and I'm actually getting confused as to my, my opinions about it. Uh, about what's going on, but um, mm -hmm. but certainly not quite the lynching. You know, where everyone bands together to, to safeguard the community from, from the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much more contested. Uh, mm. There's a long you know, track record. You know of narratives about communities that close ranks not to punish abusers or mm. let things slide mm. because it would be damaging to its image of itself. Yes. It's harder to face these troublesome realities than to ignore them. And you know, one of the things that comes across in many narratives I'm aware of, say for example, like trisexual abuse and other forms of things, is the extent to which people can do, or at least that's the story is told, you know, after the fact. Yeah. Like, there was a kind of, oh, there was something wrong with that person, but nobody ever intervened. So, in a sense, basically, what's, it's not so much a moral panic, because at this point, this is the case where there isn't this heavy kind of moral panic, mm. but, but more a sense of a community quite nevertheless careful about how it is to be perceived, uh, how, it, how, how, if you will, does its business as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it closes ranks, how does it close ranks? Yeah. Is, it doing, is it behaving differently as a community in other settings? And lots of communities have been bewildered by trauma of one sort or another mm. and don't necessarily behave according to some rational choice model. Things just happen and play out in strange and other ways. Uh, outside forces have an awful lot to do with shaping of narratives. So the media narratives of the place are not necessarily those actually of the local people. A classic moral and panic narrative is something happens and then the tabloids go bad with it. Yes. And then that's sort of available to us as an easy to access text. Yeah. But then when we speak, if we went to the actual community, we might find something very different indeed very complex, the community basically behaving in, in very different kinds of ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So wasn't there a case in the UK a number of years ago where a couple of young children were murdered? Uh, I can't remember the, the exact uh, case. Bulger. Do you mean the Not the Bulger one, a more recent one than that. But the point there, that my memory of it then was, was basically how the community actually dealt with it. It was actually very, very complex, you know. Oh, yeah. Yes. So oh, yeah. yes. 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 The thing, yeah. It was absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. And there was the issue of, of how, the, how the community basically went about its business in relation to that. There were a lot of complexities there yeah. that were actually, I guess, partly capable of explaining the actual events, uh, but also how the events were then treated or not addressed, you know? Mm -hmm. So the dynamics of community, mm -hmm. the idea of a moral panic in a simple sense doesn't seem to apply here. But what happens when you don't have that kind of moral panic? But nevertheless, you have actual community doing this business of regulating what tries to happen. Yes. Or trying to. Just have Jerry, one with the last question on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just to follow on the point of being having lived, lived through this period as an American, now the, the, this, the folk devil could be anyone, particularly any man. So you, you have, when the folk devil can be one of us, it becomes inter internalized and enormous change in the community. So I'm very aware, whenever I'm around a child, that I potentially, anything I say or do, could lead to me being accused. And I'll literally have no defense. Right? So it's changed uh, the the interactions between uh, sorry males and and children within the family, particularly outside the family. So I will literally not take care. I used to take care of kids. I will not take take care of any kids. Right? I will not be around any kids that I don't know because you always could be accused of something. And this is where the moral panic comes up, because it's expected now, mm -hmm. right, that, that you could, you're always uh, a suspect, you're always a potential folk devil, and the moral panic is internal and ready to, ready to pounce on you. So I think that's one of the long-term effects of this case in the U U.S., is that, mm -hmm. you know, it's the internalization of the potential folk devil and the moral panic not being from the news media, but being for other adults based upon one child saying one thing about about you. Okay. So, one last comment on that.
Well, I'll comment directly back to that, which is uh, the way that I would put this is maybe slightly different, but, but connects with that, which is to say that, that and there are some things that have happened in the UK that, um, so for example, if um, a block of flats is being built adjacent to a playground, it's now not possible to have windows um, at a height which would mean that you could just look over the playground. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and in a sense, what that panders to is a paedophilic imagination. Mm -hmm. It's as though we're all imminently going to leap into this kind of subject position and start abusing children. So that, that whole idea, I think, has meant that the adult's relationship to children has become much more you know, difficult. Okay, on this note of Bantam reversed. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for an alarming talk. And, um...